Hello, hello, hello. This is John with Gringo CTO. Today, I wanted to cover shock of all shocks. Um, the question, age old question of whether you should use an LRM in your project. Um, I can make this one real short if I want to. Uh, no. <laughs> Actually, it's not quite that simple. Um, I think they are overused, but I will get into that in a moment. Um, first, we're going to define ORM to be an initiated. Uh, it is an object relational mapper. Um, think of this as any sort of layer that takes your data, uh, which hopefully is in a relational data store like Postgres or MySQL per other videos that I have posted, um, and transforms that into a form that is um, uh, an object in whatever language or environment that you're working in. So um, if you are coming from a Rails background, for example, the active record um, ORM is very common there and exists primarily to um, translate your database tables into objects in Ruby. And in the case of Rails specifically, there's a lot of uh, magic, let's say, around conventions that help you connect to that database, uh, do reads, do writes, stuff of that nature. Most of the major ecosystems and their tools will have uh, an ORM like this. Um, of course, in uh, Node world, it's a little bit more fragmented, uh, but in Laravel, we have uh, Eloquent. In Django, you have the Django ORM, etc. cetera. Uh, but yeah, fundamentally, they all do basically the same thing, uh, which is translate your database objects into language objects, um, usually with some other behavior and, and things like that on top. Um, so talk about some advantages. And let's talk about some disadvantages. Disadvantages of not actually a tag notion. Surprise, surprise. Um, okay. So the biggest advantage of an ORM is that it's uh, going to make easy things easy. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if you have an object, um, so let's call it uh, user, and I want to get um, the first name off that object, Something very uh, simple like this is going to be extremely straightforward in an ORM. Um, because fundamentally it is, if you think about it from the perspective, I find it easiest to reason if I were writing an ORM, what is it going to look like? And there's many ways you could do it, I suppose, but um, a lot of times you are restricted to doing things that make sense, of course, in the language that you're translating to, as opposed to things that make sense natively in SQL. So dereferencing an object is going to make a lot of sense in, in most languages. It's a very natural thing to do, and it also translates cleanly into uh, SQL, because you're just uh, translating something that you want on an object into the corresponding field um, in the table. And so something like that is going to work very well. And uh, you can contrast that to the left uh, first name from users where blah, blah, blah. Uh, more commonly, if you did want to use raw SQL instead of uh, an ORM, you would in turn wrap that into some sort of uh, wrapper function or you know whatever pattern that you want to use there, repository, et cetera, uh, to control the, the data access. Um, so you could just have an object that you've already fetched and then get the data that you need uh, versus writing handwritten SQL uh, to, to get stuff. So for the simple things, something like this, of course, is going to be very easy. And probably like 80% of the time, uh, your stuff is going to look or feel something like this. Um, so let's call it single single table, single model interactions tend to be very straightforward with uh, an ORM because they map most cleanly to the, the constructs that you have in the, the destination language. Um, the disadvantages are going to be basically the exact opposite. So multi-table or multi-model. Um, so what I mean by this is that anytime you start having to do joins, that's where things get weird, uh, usually in whatever language you're trying to map to. So if my user has a purchase and my purchase has a product and somehow I need to join all of these things, um, this is almost a cliche, it's so common, but you can get the n plus one problem where uh, imagine that I'm in some sort of loop and uh, in, let's say users, and I want to iterate through all of the users in a, a collection. 
And if I'm not careful, every time I dereference the purchase or dereference the product, I can actually end up with an in like a, a combinatorial uh, in plus one, in plus one kind of situation where my outer loop, I might be saying, okay, give me uh, the user with uh, with this ID. Um, and my pseudo code is terrible here, but give me a user with uh, this ID. Um, and for that user, give me all products. And then for that product, give me, uh, sorry, all purchases. And then for those purchases, give me all products. Um, and because ORMs by design will abstract the actual SQL from you, like you're not seeing this um, and understanding all of the joins that are taking place, it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. And uh, a small list of users uh, could lead to just multiplicative uh, requests to the database. Whereas in contrast, um, if you're writing your SQL by hand, um, which there is a middle way that we're going to talk to in, in a second, but if you were writing your SQL like by hand, you would realize pretty quickly, okay, I am selecting some stuff from users and now I need to join on purchases um, and uh, products, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the, the SQL is just a little bit more direct. It's ultimately what the ORM is translating into. So you will see performance problems like this and just probably solve them before they actually become an issue. Um, if you remember back in the day um, when Rails had its moment call it around 2010 to 2015, kind of those years in there. And every company that was doing anything interesting was on Rails, it seemed like. Um, but Rails got this reputation for not being able to, uh, to scale, um, which is interesting, uh, probably undeserved, or at least not, not a complete picture in the sense that it wasn't Rails so much that was the problem. It was usually stuff like this, where uh, people would put loops and loops and do really um, suboptimal queries and then try to join all of this stuff uh, back in memory in, in the application. And that's another common uh, problem, like pitfall I see with ORMs. Um, we'll just say in general that it obscures the details of your queries. And so that, um, that does let you do things easily. Um, the same thing with make it great up here, you know, it makes things easy also make it a, a problem later when details about why your stuff is slow, uh, let the n plus one problem become hidden from you as, uh, as the developer. Um, so another example of this, uh, I saw this in a project that I was, I was helping out with, I think it was in Django. And um, the developer wrote the query, so uh, they had, I can't remember the context exactly off the top of my head, but it was something like query one. Um, pull down all users. Query two, pull down, I think this is like a, a crypto property, pull down all wallets and then um, join. Yeah, so pull down everything and then do a join in memory. Um, and so this is just purely a failure of understanding SQL and, and how it works. Um, and so I just re architected that, or I mean, really refactored it more so that uh, all of this stuff took place in SQL and I used some window functions and, and all of that to do a ranking and, and all of these things. And it turned out that uh, we got what was taking minutes to run a query in production and like we got it down to, uh, to I think it was one or two seconds. Um, so those sorts of things, those wins are out there. Uh, and it's like anything, if you're taking an expensive operation and you're running it inside nested loops, of course, it's gonna take a ton of time. And I'd say the biggest disadvantage of an ORM usually is that it makes it very easy to do very bad things like that. And it's not that you are dumb as a developer, it's just that the system hides the details about what it is doing such that it is very easy to write what amounts to dumb code without realizing it. Um, so with that in mind, I would say that um, I am not a huge fan of ORMs. I am willing to use them in certain cases. Um, I like to look for middle ways when possible where you can keep the good stuff and then get rid of the bad. Um, so my general philosophy is use an ORM for the parts that it's good at. So coming back to my example up here uh, where you're getting first name off a user, um, there is practically no difference between the SQL that I would write and the SQL that the ORM is going to generate for something very simple like that. Um, and the chances of me ever needing to go and tweak it in a way to get more performance out of it are very low. Um, so in those cases, like I don't see any problem with uh, using an ORM for the things that it is good at. Okay, so you guys can see that, well, broader context, um, the idea here is that we are 
converting from a user's um, domestic currency into something that we can search by in the database. So for context, the, uh, the database table has uh, a listing, like a property, um, a price, then uh, a base currency for that price. And then of course the user has um, a base currency for their searches. Um, and also to make things even more interesting, sometimes we're talking about an individual property that has a price. Sometimes it's a range of min to max. Um, we need to coalesce all of that. Uh, query that, that that is that complex is actually going to be very hard to express in an ORM because um, you have all of the things that would make it difficult. Um, so you can see in here actually in, yeah, I have sort of a, a shared um, query that I'm using just to convert between currencies. Like the naive way to do this would be that you um, basically say, give me the, the prices, uh, pull them down uh, from the network, uh, the database rather, and then do all of your filtering, sorting and everything in the application before passing it to the user. Um, and instead what we're doing is uh, we're saying, well, look, give me the rates uh, from the exchange rates table that match uh, you know, what I'm looking for in terms of the user's parameters. Um, and then we come back here, we do some you know, fancy SQL, I guess, to basically say, okay, after converting it to the, uh, the reference currency, um, you know, coalesce the, the columns that we need, and then, uh, of course, interpolate the, the value um, and give us back the properties that meet the, the criteria. Um, so these are cases where I'm, I'm sure you probably could do this in the ORM if you wanted to, but it's going to be a pain in the ass, to put it mildly. And so it, you're much better off, I think, typically, um, just in a case like this, especially either going the query builder route or probably just going raw SQL, which is uh, what, the, what I did. Um, because, you know, in this particular case, uh, it was actually just faster for me to write the SQL than it would have been to figure out how to, how to do any sort of ORM based query. So that's an example of how that looks um, in a, a slightly more practical case. So um, that would be my recommendation is, you know, if you want my opinion on how to do all of this, Use an ORM for the 80% case where you are referencing a few fields on one model. Um, and then I would say the moment you start doing joins, start using a query builder. Um, and then if you have highly complex SQL um, that tends to be specific to uh, whatever vendor that you're using, especially, then you want to go wrong. Um, Ideally, uh, if you're having to, to choose like what product do I use as far as a uh, query builder or whatever, because sometimes they lock you in like in your ecosystem or whatever. Like Django, you don't really have that much of a choice of what you use, but I mean, most of them will at least give you uh, the ability to, uh, to to dive down to the raw layer if you need to. So that's nothing. Like worst case scenario, you have that escape hatch. Um, I like that Eloquent in Laravel land gives you a query builder as well. Uh, that is quite nice in my opinion. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something to consider up front is what degree of lock-in are you getting through your, your ORM and uh, just making sure that you don't end up in a situation where you have to use it for uh, for things because there will come a time where it's just not the right tool for the job. And you know, the last 20% um, is where you have queries that are taking forever and like you need the chance to hand tune them or, or what have you. So um, that would be, be my guidance on that. Um, cool. All right. Any questions, comments, leave them in the, the comments below. Please like, please subscribe. It's a new channel. Everything helps. And, um, yeah, any and all feedback is helpful. Uh, if you want more videos like this, please tell me. If you don't, please tell me. All right. Have a great day.